I'm Jackie Hess with George Mason Friends. Our organization of volunteers support programs and activities at George Mason Regional Library in Annandale, Virginia, as well as literacy and family engagement efforts throughout the county. George Mason Friends is pleased to sponsor this fall for the book event in memory of Charlotte Sell, a longtime volunteer who was committed to increasing literacy among adults and children. Welcome to Reimagining the Classics at Fall for the Book 2020. Tonight's event marks the end of the 2020 festival, but you can find recordings of several of this year's events at fallforthebook.org or by following us on Crowdcast. You can do that by clicking the Fall for the Book icon above this window and then clicking follow. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Madeline Miller and Emily Wilson. Madeline Miller studied classics at Brown University and has taught and tutored Latin, Greek, and Shakespeare to high school students for more than 15 years. She also studied at the University of Chicago and the Yale School of Drama, where she focused on the adaptation of classical texts to modern forms. She is the author of two novels, the Song of Achilles was awarded the 2012 Orange Prize for Fiction, and her latest novel, Circe, was an instant New York Times bestseller. Her work has been translated into 25 languages, and her essays have appeared in The Guardian, Wall Street Journal, Laugham's Quarterly, and NPR.org. She currently lives outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Emily Wilson is Professor of Classical Studies and Chair of the Program in Comparative Literature and Literary Theory at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of Mocked to Death, Tragic Overliving from Sophocles to Milton, The Death of Socrates, Hero, Villain, Chatterbox, Saint, and The Greatest Empire, A Life of Seneca, as well as the translator of Six Tragedies of Seneca and Four Plays by Euripides. Her translation of the Odyssey was hailed by the Guardian as a cultural landmark and was named one of the New York Times 100 notable books of 2018. The authors will be in conversation with Dr. Olga Arns, Assistant Professor in the Department of Modern and Classical Languages at George Mason University. Hello all. Mm -hmm. My name is Olga Ahrens. I'm professor of classics at George Mason University. And welcome all to the Fall for the Book 2020. Uh, this free online events run from September to November. Uh, you can find the full schedule at the fallforthebook.org. And be sure to follow us on Crowdcast. You can also uh, do that by clicking the fall for the book icon above this window and then click follow. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the two distinguished authors, both scholars and creative writers, Madeline Miller and uh, Dr. Emily Wilson. Uh, what's fascinating about them is that they are not just scholars, but they both read and rewrite the ancient tradition. Uh, now we are concerned with a piece nearly 3,000 years old, American Odyssey. And uh, they managed to discover some new twists, new voices, new uh, nuances, uh, entirely new reinterpretations of the poems so that the reader will never read the Iliad and the Odyssey with the same eyes as before. Well, let me start with a few words about the issue of authors. Uh, Madeline Miller holds her Master of Arts degree in Classics from Brown University, which is augmented by experience with the University of Chicago's Committee of Social Thought on Social Thought and uh, in the Dramaturgy Department at the Yale School of Drama where she has focused on the adaptation of classical texts to modern forms. She has been teaching classical languages and literature in both high school and college levels. 
Uh, Madeline's first novel, The Song of Achilles, earned the resounding acclamation as the New York Times bestseller, bringing her uh, the 2012 Orange Prize for Fiction. Her second novel, Circe, was an instant number one New York, New York Times bestseller and won the Indies Choice Best Adult Fiction of the Year Award and the Indies Choice Best Audio, Audio Book of the Year Award, among other honors. Circe was also um, uh, the winner of the Red Tentacle Award and the American Library Association Alex Award. Um, adult books of special interest to teen readers and the 2018 L Big Book Award. It's currently being adapted for a series which the HBO Max and her novels have been translated into 25 languages including Dutch, Mandarin, Chinese, Turkish, Arabic and Greek. Her sales have appeared in a number of publications including The Guardian, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Telegraph, Latin's Quarterly and the National Public Radio. Uh, Dr. Amelia Wilson is a professor of classical studies and the chair of the program in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of a number of books and articles on a variety of classical subjects, including, just to name a few, theoretical study of the genre of tragedy, predicament of the senescent tragic authors, from Sophocles to Milton, the life and death of Socrates, who was the pivotal figure of the history of philosophy, the dramas of the Roman philosopher and tragedian Seneca. She also has translated the six tragedies of Seneca, four plays of Euripides, and now the Homeric Odyssey in 2017. Um, so let me start with a question to Emily. As the range of the Odyssey's interpretation has extended from anything from primitive folk tale with cannibalism and monsters to the neoplatonic allegory of the wanderings of soul in search of the true home, as he did in Porphyry. So what's your overall view of the Odyssey and Odysseus and his adventures as we have it now? Yes, you're, I mean, you're, you're right in the question that, of course, the Odyssey has been read many, many different ways at different periods of history. I just did a Norton critical edition of the Odyssey, which involved choosing some extracts of both modern scholarship and other things to read along with the poem. And one of the great interests of doing that was trying to figure out how can I give people a taster of how differently the poem has been read at different eras. Um, and it seems to me that um, reading the Odyssey now in 2020, it feels different to me even than it did in 2025, or, or even, even than in 2015, even, the, even than in 2000, even than when I first started my translation. The, the Odyssey is constantly changing in the ways that it's read, and it's constantly changing both because scholarship changes, criticism of the poem changes, and our own culture changes. I don't feel like one can sum up, this is what the Odyssey is always going to be. The Odyssey means many different things to many people in different parts of the world, it means different things. I mean, for me nowadays, I sort of notice in ways that I didn't when I first started reading the Odyssey, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, I don't think I sort of fully thought about the ways it's a poem both about migration, colonization, and also leadership, abuse of power. I mean, I think I was always aware that it's a poem which is about different kinds of, different ways of performing gender, different ways of performing gender as a goddess versus an enslaved woman. But I think the ways that it's very subtle in its different depictions of different social classes and its depiction of different worlds within worlds. What does a home mean? What does a community mean? It's different for different people in different places. The ways the Odyssey is a poem about diversity, I think that feels sort of clear from the perspective of America in 2020 in a way that it wasn't to me reading it in Oxford in the 1990s, for instance, even though that was still an issue. It just wasn't as obvious to me as it is now. Okay. Well, Madeline, uh, the Odyssey, as any heroic epic, is a poem of quest. And as compared to the Iliad, and you wrote on both, whereas in the Iliad, the quest of Achilles is for glory, for honor. Uh, the quest of Odysseus is infinitely more humble. He strives for his home and wife. And yet, as he 
is doing so, the simple every man square takes him to the ultimate extremes of the world and beyond to the realm of the dead, even to uh, the love beds of the goddesses. So what do you find particularly intriguing in this combination of mythical wonders and every man's plea in the Odyssey? Mm. Well, I think that this goes back a little bit to um, sort of how we look at Odysseus and, and how we see him, because I think it's very clear that a lot of people do see him a, as an everyman, and he's been really embraced um, as a character who is incredibly sympathetic, he's an underdog, he's got a great wife, you know, that, that we all sort of can, can resonate with that. But actually, he's almost as much, you know, interested in fame and glory and honor as Achilles is. It's just that is not how sort of, you know, we're, we're used to thinking of them. Um, so many of his actions are motivated by his desire for fame, his desire for recognition, um, his desire for stuff. He loves accruing stuff um, over the course of the poem. And so part of what um, drew me to it actually is kind of wanting to push back against that narrative of him as, you know, I, I have some sympathies for Odysseus as well, but um, but I also see him as, as a much more um, a difficult, complicated, multifaceted character. And having worked with Achilles so closely with Song of Achilles, um, in many ways, I, I find Odysseus much less sympathetic, <laughs> partially because of his, you know, huge dishonesty. As Achilles tells us in, in the Iliad, I hate like the gates of death, the man who says one thing and, and hides another in his heart. Um, which is pretty much the definition of Odysseus. So it's interesting oh. to sort of compare in many ways Odysseus um, and Achilles are foils for each other, but in other ways they are motivated by that same desire to, to be lifted in their field. So um, partially what I wanted to do is kind of speak back to that Odysseus, but part of what I wanted to do is also to minimize Odysseus, that I feel like he has had sort of 3,000 years almost to enchant us, to tell his story, to be beloved. And I thought, you know, get off the stage, Odysseus. Um, yeah. It's time for some of these side characters to kind of get to tell their full story without their story being kind of shunted to the side. And, and one of those stories that has always jumped out at me was Cersei's story, of course. But I think as, as Emily alluded to, there are so many characters at the side of the Odyssey that I think could be excavated and could be at the center of their own novels. Thank you. Well, Emily, your translation strikes me as both traditional and yet innovative at the same time. Uh, for you uh, put it at a lucid traditional young pentameter, natural for English, uh, which brings out the less obvious details of the Homeric text, uh, helps the reader, especially young reader, to uh, past the struggles with hexameter uh, and yet peek on certain implied details, especially concerning minor characters and nuances of personal interrelationships. Uh, so uh, what do you think is the primary task of the translator? This is, I mean, this, it depends on whether you're doing a retranslation of a much translated text, as I was with this, as opposed to if you're translating a modern novel or a modern poem for the first time. I think there are different kinds of responsibilities of translating a living versus a long dead, dead probably multiple, never existed kind of author like Homer. Um, it seemed to me that there's no reason to do a translation of the Odyssey at all if there are already almost 70 in English, if you're just going to replicate, if I'm just going to, just going to write out the translation of Fagels or the translation of Lattimore or do something that's more or less the same, why am I doing that? I wouldn't have signed the contract to do it and spend five years of my life wasting, wasting time on that or wasting my readers and editors time. Um, so I, in, before deciding to do the project at all, I sort of thought about, are there things that I, I get out of reading the Odyssey in Greek that I find a hard, I have a hard time getting across to my students when I'm teaching it in translation, and also that I have a, that I realize are there in, in um, Anglophone reception of the Odyssey that are maybe being there are, there are misleading ideas or just ways that there are think there are elements of the poem which might not be there as much in English translations. And I think ideally there should be a possible possible place to see these things that I think are there in the Greek. So one element, as you've emphasized, is metricality. 
the, the best-selling um, American and British translations before mine were mostly non-metrical ones. I mean, like the Lattimore, like the Fagels, they're free verse, they have no regular rhythm. And it seemed to me that the rhythmicality of the Homeric poems is so essential to their, to what it means to experience them if you're reading in Greek or if you're an ancient person listening to the Homeric poems, the fact that it taps into instantly, even if you're not thinking what, what's the meter, you just hear it in your mind or you, it invites reading out loud. I, I felt that writing in very, very regular iambic pentameter was the way to evoke an equivalent experience for the anglophone reader. And then on the other hand, as I, as I was trying to hint a little bit before, um, I, I love the diversity of the original poem, both its diversity of perspectives, the diversity of its, its protagonist is, as Madeline said, himself diverse. Like he's, he's multiple different people. He's always showing up and pretending to be somebody else, spinning another tall tale. But then the people around him are also very diverse. It's not all told through his perspective. I think one of the things that um, critical readings of the poem has really taught us over the last 20 years, um, the narratological approaches have shown us how Homeric point of view is really subtle. It's not always shaped through one, one character. It shifts around. It's not, it's not like a third person omniscient narrator. It's a narrative where here we're speaking, through, we're seeing through one person's eyes and then we're seeing through another person's eyes. It has a proto-dramatic quality where each of the characters has their own voice and the, the different voices, different perspectives are really important. And so for me, um, I wanted both to do a very regularly metrical translation that, that had some of the clarity, the syntactical clarity of the original, like not to make it more difficult than the original is. The, the original is not difficult Greek, um, but then also to bring out the social and ethical complexity and the narrat narratological complexity, where, which is related to a sort of ethical question about are we always seeing Odysseus as poor old Odysseus, we really hope he gets home? Or are we also seeing the complexity of enslaving elite Odysseus, who's constantly portraying people and lying to people and slaughtering people and trying to get more stuff? We, we see all those Odysseuses and we also see what it's like to be abandoned by him or slaughtered by him or married to him or enslaved by him. We see those, all those different perspectives. And so I felt there was a way to try to bring that out a little bit, those elements out more clearly than I felt was done in most of the translations I'd looked at in, in English at least. Well, thank you. And that precisely brings us to the next question, which I want to ask Madeleine. You already touched upon it. Let's do a bit more Odysseus bashing. <laughs> <laughs> He's perhaps the most ambiguous character of classical literature. Um, he cannot be defined by a simple, simplified formula. He's famously wise, nevertheless, he's a disastrous king. He lost every ship, every man. It took him 20 years to find a way home, which is a couple days away, maybe. Uh, and then he uh, decimated the bloom of Ithaca's young males. Uh, killing Penelope's suitors and then causing revolt of Ithaca's population. Um, how do you recon reconcile this horrible Odysseus with heroic Odysseus? Um, well, I think I think you said with hero Odysseus, is that is that right? Well, I, I think partially it has to do with a little bit of how we use the word hero. Um, which is that, that we use it in, in a bit of a different way. I think I think we use it to mean a, a positive thing. Um, whereas, you know, I think the ancients were very aware of the, um, you know, folly of their huge heroes. I mean, Achilles, Odysseus, all, all of them, um, Ajax. And so uh, part of what I wanted to do as I was approaching Odysseus in my novel, aside from keeping him constrained to just his part of it, <laughs> um, was that I, I wanted to kind of approach him from different perspectives, because I do see him as the great chameleon, which means that he is sometimes the hero of, of a story when he interacts with you, and he is sometimes the villain of the story. And I think you see that in the ancient sources. One of my favorite um, plays from the ancient world is, is Philoctetes, where he's basically the villain. And um, so I, I love that he kind of can show up and play a different role depending on, on where he is, partially because of, of just that chameleonic nature, that multifaceted nature that he has. Um, he's kind of a villain in Song of Achilles, my first novel, because he's, he's a bit of an antagonist to, to Achilles and Patroclus's relationship. So 
So in Circe, rather than sort of saying, this is what Odysseus is, um, I, I chose to sort of really shape his interactions with Circe around that exact moment in their lives when they meet each other. That the moment that they meet each other is all about where she is at that moment and what has happened to her leading up to that moment. She's actually in one of her most sort of challenging psychological states. She's traumatized. She's dealing with trauma. She's extremely angry. She's vulnerable. She really feels totally alienated from the world around her. And Odysseus is somehow able to sort of, she's able to kind of form a connection with him. And he is also, you know, very alienated. A god is, you know, Poseidon hates him. He's lost all of his ships except for one. He's angry. He's depressed. Um, he sort of doesn't know what's going to happen next. And then he and Circe are able to kind of come together just in that moment. But I didn't want that moment to necessarily stand for their personalities. I, I think then Cersei ends up going off in a, in a completely other direction. So what I wanted to do is sort of encapsulate how she sees him at that particular moment of her life, but then to circle back and allow there to be some other people who tell stories about him. Um, partially, his son Telemachus has a different view of Odysseus. Um, Penelope has a different view of Odysseus, and that these stories also sort of get told. Even Athena gets a little bit, gets to talk about him a little bit. And so we start seeing how he can be different things to different people because he is so changeable. But I, I also think I sort of, the last thing, is since, since the question started out, is Odysseus bashing, um, is that I do question from a psychological perspective whether or not you can be such a chameleon and still be a good person. That he he changes so so quickly and so much um, that you sort of wonder, you know, what would it be like to really try to have a relationship with this person? Would you ever be sure that you were really there with them, or were you just there with their with the construction of them? So maybe good person is the wrong word, but could they ever really be? You know, do they have a self anymore? Madeline, I think you're a better person than I am. I think I identify more with that element of Odysseus than you do. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but I'm sure you're a better person than I am. <laughs> well, it makes for a very wonderful character to write about. I mean, certainly it really it's does. Yes. Yes. It's, a, it's it makes him fascinating to write. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And that's also what he shares with Athena, right? That she's also constantly in disguise and constantly transforming herself. And yeah. it's never really about pinning her down to one thing. It's always got to be weaving something else. Yes. 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 Well, Emily, translation of the Odyssey has been singled out as the first English translation of the poem done by a woman. Um, it may not be all that important per se, but uh, what's interesting is that the Odyssey has long been marked uh, with a visible feminine presence and feminine appeal. Um, as compared to the Iliad, where women are mostly passive causes or victims uh, of the conflict, in the Odyssey, women are actively involved, they plot, they scheme to make claims, they clash, they have the individual stories on all levels, from goddesses to queens to slave women. Already Richard Bentley, late 17th, 18th century, suggested that the Iliad was a poem for men and Odyssey for the other sex. And uh, Samuel Butler, in the end of 19th century, wrote a book, The Authors of the Odyssey. He suggested that the poem was, in fact, composed by a woman um, and uh, evolves around concentric cycles of metaphorical unity of its female characters. Penelope, Calypso, and Circe as essentially the same the metaphor of the same female essence. Uh, I bet Madden has something to say about it, too. Uh, so has this gender-specific, shall we say, aspect of the Odyssey contributed? Uh, to your rendition. Um, I mean, I guess I, I first want to say I'm working on a translation of the Iliad right now. I'm really into it. And I, I always, I mean, I think if you'd asked me um, five, 10, 20 years ago, which was my favorite, I would definitely have said the Iliad. I love the Iliad. 
but I'd actually do, I would dispute all of everything that these um, that Bentley and Butler say. I mean, I, I think it's of course one can one can be interested in literature no matter what the various genders are of characters. Um, of course, also the Iliad has a lot of really interesting female characters. I mean, a lot of the battlefield action involves um, the tussles between Hera and Athena. And that the dynamic between Hera and Athena and Thetis and Aphrodite is actually really, really important in the poem, as well as the mortal characters who are being, or mortal females who are being argued over. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I feel that I've been asked so many times why I'm a woman by different interviewers and conversation people, because of course the headline that it happens to be the first um, translation into English by a woman, though as you know, not into many, many other languages. And I know that male translators of the Odyssey are generally not asked what is their, the impact of their maleness on their awareness or lack of awareness of the ways that the poem is about both masculinity and femininity and different ways that those different genders are, are coded in different ways and performed in different ways in this poem. Um, I mean, I'm interested in gender, and I'm, I tr I've tried to think very, very hard as I've done both all of my translations about how am I going to use pronouns, how exactly am I going to um, use words which may have particular connotations in English within our, our social world um, that may be somewhat different in their genderings from the connotations of words within um, either Greek or Roman contexts. I mean, I guess an example that constantly comes up is I was very surprised after I published my translation to look at other translations into English and realize how many translators into English of the scene in which Telemachus hangs the 12 enslaved women and also castrates, mutilate, mutilates and murders the enslaved man. Um, and in that scene, a lot of English translators import abusive language as if in the mouth of Telemachus but also as if in the mouth of the narrator against the women, which is not what the Greek text does. And I don't think it necessarily means that you have to be a woman translator in order to not put the word sluts in there, if the Greek doesn't suggest it. I think you could be a man and not do that. And so it's sort of surprising that so many men have chosen to do that. It tells you something, I think, particular about you know, 20th century male American translators, rather than necessarily about you know, gender across time and space. Um, Anyway, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what else to say about that. I probably have. But I think it also tells you something about the particular um, gender dynamics of translation, specifically into English of specifically ancient texts, that it's extremely um, old male dominated, which is not true of literary translation in general, which is very, um, which is usually pretty much 50 50. Translation uh, in the non, non literary spheres which tends to be very poorly paid and not um, recompensed very much in terms of honor as well as um, economics, it tends to be female dominated. I mean, if you want to hire a legal translator to translate some documents from Russian or German, it's probably gonna be a woman who's gonna do the work for you. Um, so I think it's surprising that within this particular field and just into English, not into Italian or um, other European languages, um, it tends to be male dominated. Well. Thank you, Emily. If I see some questions from the audience are coming, but um, I wish before we go to particular questions, address yet one aspect. Madeleine, in your work, you have revisited and re revived both Homeric poems. In the Song of Achilles follows the Iliad event and Circe follows the Odyssey. And while the Iliad is a rather straightforward narrative, the Odyssey is a more wayward, tortuous, fraught with magic, enchantment, supernatural. So your Circe appears to be more convoluted and more introspective and noble. In Homer, Odysseus speaks for his own self. But you chose with your knack for looking through the eyes of a non-major characters. Circe. Why Circe? Um, so, not Penelope, not Calypso, who have stronger claims for Odysseus, and not Nausicaa. Uh, Circe seems to, to have the least emotional involvement. She, uh, we don't know anything about her feelings, if any, and she, she is the least human. So why Circe? Mm. Um, that's a, a great question. And I, I, before I answer, I just want to say that um, I agree with you, Emily, about completely repudiating those comments about the Iliad and the Odyssey and gender. Um, and I also 
prefer the Iliad always. <laughs> and I, I think I think I cannot wait to hear. I think it really needs your take on it. And I, I can't wait to see how you handle characters like Helen, who I think have also kind of gotten the, you know, the treatment of the women who are hanged. Um, I feel like there are many, many female characters in the Iliad that have gotten a lot of shaping to their character from translators that is not necessarily in the text. So I'm really excited to see how you tease out their characters. Um, but why Circe? You know, I, I think partially, so a little bit of my answer is, is gonna be unsatisfying, which is that because that's the character that I was obsessed with. Um, and, you know, as a novelist, I, I have learned sort of not to question that feeling that if there's a character who I can't get out of my mind, who I'm trying to understand a mystery about or a story about, that I just need to, to head in that direction. Um, so there was no moment where I was kind of looking at all the women of the Odyssey and thinking, well, which one should I pick? It was it was always Circe. I never considered my the only thing I thought about Calypso is should I have a passing reference to Calypso? No, I cut her. Um, it just wasn't part of the story. But I, I think part of what drew me to Circe is is sort of two things. One is that I felt that there was this mystery about her that because we see so little of her motives, because she's presented so much as both a male fantasy and sort of this object, this incarnation of male anxiety about female power at the same time, sort of the mysterious woman who shows up and hosts you and then just disappears um, without ever asking for anything for herself, without ever, you know what I mean? There's sort of this like fantasy of the perfect woman in kind of the second half of the episode and then this terror about her um, in the first half and by taming her Odysseus is able to create the fantasy woman out of the frightening woman. So, you know, I was angry about all of that. Um, and, I, and I kind of wanted to see, well, who is this Cersei? If we look from her perspective, why is she turning men into pigs? That seemed like a really important omission in the, in the Odyssey. Um, why would you start doing something like that? It's pretty extreme. What does it mean to turn someone into a pig? Why, why pigs, for instance? Um, I don't have Cersei spell that out, why pigs, in the novel, but I have an answer, and I, I think she sort of understands it um, in, a, in an oblique way in, in my novel. Um, I also really wanted to, so partially I wanted to explore that mystery, and then I, I wanted to kind of push back, but I, I was also drawn to the fact that she is one of the many, I think, um, female artists of the Odyssey. You see it in Penelope and also Calypso. Um, you might even say Athena is is in her in her own way. We know she's an artist in, in sort of other um, other aspects, although she doesn't manifest it so much in, in the Odyssey. So I love the fact that she was an artist, both in her witchcraft and in her weaving, and even you might even say in her singing. Um, and I love the fact that her witchcraft was this kind of side way of getting power that you know as a lesser goddess she basically had very little leverage very little agency um as calypso you know very very little ability to maneuver in this world of larger gods and male gods as calypso complains about but cersei has somehow kind of found her way around that and she has found her way around that through witchcraft which again sort of felt like a real art it's not sort of the snapping your fingers power of the gods it comes out of her knowledge of how to combine herbs how to cut herbs how to say the spells how to mix the potions so i was really interested in her in her artistry and in finding sort of piercing that veil of of mystery and that kind of very fant fantasy kind of seeing her as an object perspective yeah and you Mm, novel is a, a sort of tapestry in its own right. You repeat this Penelope and Circe's uh, weaving, if you wish, because Calypso, that folk, Circe, sorry, Calypso, too, in a way, uh, is both very really so peripheral figure and yet central to the archaic Greek minor saga. Somehow it, it gave you. Circe gave you the access to the story of the, the Crete and the Minotaur, and uh, she is the niece of Medea. They are the two witches of Greek saga, both uh, barbarians, and yet very crucial to the essence of um, classical legacy. Uh, I know Penelope and Circe in a bizarre way, which uh, the saga, uh, and change places 
how to explain it. There's some audible <laughs> touch, of course, to it. <laughs> um, I, Penelope told me what she wanted when I got there. I, I didn't I didn't go in knowing what I was gonna do with Penelope, except for the fact that I wanted to break out from um, the sort of obsession in the Odyssey of what man she's attached to and how she's going to fill this very uh, narrow you know role of is she gonna stay loyal to Odysseus? Is she gonna marry someone else? How is she gonna deal with her with her son? That sort of all her relationships seem seem about that. Is she gonna go back and you know? be with her father. I mean, there, there are all these sort of questions about her relationship to men in the story. And so I didn't want her story to end that way at all. I really wanted it to end with her relationship with women, which is kind of hinted at in the Odyssey, but really not not spelled out at all. And so so she and Circe, um, I felt, had, had a lot in common, um, but also a, lo a lot to, to learn from each other. So I, I was very... I was really looking forward to writing those scenes in the last kind of quarter of the novel between Cersei and Penelope and sort of having them, seeing how they developed when they were talking to each other. Well, thank you, Madeline. Let's give the floor to the audience questions. Uh, one address to both Emily and Madeline, that's all from how I figured it out. What is it that attracts us to the Greek and Latin classics? And do you think it comes uh, at the expense of other cultural mythologies, especially as in literature previously, unheard or marginal marginalized voices uh, finally able to come forward, which this year the book shortlisted them on straight? This is the question. What's the, as, as I rephrase it, what's the attraction and the function of classics at the background of the broader spectrum of comparative mythology. Emily, do you want to go first? Or I can go. No, I mean, I personally think that both um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome are, are two or multiple fascinating, very, very alien cultures. And part of me really wishes that they weren't, um, you know, why are they so much better, so much better known than ancient India within modern, um, within modern, white American culture, why are they so much better known than classical classical Chinese culture? It's not that I think they're better in any possible way. I don't see how, what metric you could possibly use to say, this is a better mythology than that mythology, or this is a better epic poem than that epic poem. I mean, I think, you know, I'm not a specialist in Indian epic, but I think it's, from what I've read in translation, absolutely fascinating. And I think there'll be absolutely no justification for saying we're reading these because they are, by some absurd standard, the right ones to be reading. Um, I mean, I'm not qualified to engage with or produce a translation of the Ramayana. I'm qualified to do it for the Odyssey and to open up new ways of looking at this particular very alien, very distant culture and find different ways that it might speak to with back from our culture in ways that I think are potentially sort of useful if you're thinking, um, how, how, are we, how have we privileged the voices of um, white European heritage men. I think that's actually not a not a completely alien question to the question that we're having about Odysseus, right? It's it's a it's a, it's a question which is, in some ways, there in the poem about how is Odysseus's voice getting all this power and getting privileged, even though he's so totally untrustworthy, such a terrible leader, and what what if we did pay pay, pay at least as much attention um, as the poem does, and what if we paid even more attention to those who are the victims of um, this particular form of leadership, this particular form of quote unquote heroism. And so I think the poem, uh, this poem in particular, but Greek and Roman literature in general, they are, they're literatures from enslaving, unequal, abusive societies, which are very distant from our own unequal society. But I think they can sort of speak to our, our unequal, abusive society and give us, you know, backwards kinds of mirrors for thinking about the kinds of issues that we should be thinking about now. Thank you, Emily. Maybe yeah. Madeline, we should take oh. a question. Is well, something we touched upon. Uh, as two people who have highlighted the classics for the modern, it sounds like you have pulled out pieces and characters who have long been censored, 
women queer characters and themes where the male heroes are not traditionally masculine. What previously censored elements do you feel your works have especially discovered or highlighted or which was your favorite? Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to, um, before I answer that, I want to kind of tag on to something that, that Emily just said, which is, I think that as classicists, Emily, I don't know if you get this or not, but I get asked a lot with like, isn't it terrible that people aren't reading the Odyssey and the mm -hmm. Iliad in school anymore? Isn't it terrible? There's sort of this, like, I think oftentimes people turn to me as if I'm like defender of, you know, civilization against the barbarians by holding up classics. I could not disagree with that more. Me too. Um, yes. Yes. And, and I, I, anyone who says that to me is going to be very disappointed in my answer because I feel that all my sensibility, although I love classics and, and part of my sensibility comes from, you know, steeping myself in classics, this huge other piece, the part that made me a writer came from contemporary voices, voices like, you know, who, who are interacting with that tradition sometimes, but oftentimes not interacting, coming from all kinds of different traditions. Um, you know, Isabel Allende and um, Amy Tan and Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, I mean, these were the touchstones of my, of my early writing years. And they, they weren't classics at all. And so, and I feel like that they should be there just as much. And if the Iliad and the Odyssey can't compete, then they can't compete. Um, now, I think that thanks to Emily Wilson, they can, com the Odyssey at least can compete <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, uh, so I, I absolutely don't think that we should be privileging these texts as some sort of extra special text. There is nothing inherent in them that makes them better. You know, they have to, they have to survive on their merit and they have to keep speaking to, to new generations and, and, um, and they're absolutely, they need to be part of a balanced curriculum if they are part of it at all. So um, on top of that, now to answer your question, um, I, I think it was all that training that I that I got in sort of looking looking at, at other voices, wanting to look at, at voices that kind of came more from the margins that um, then I wanted to apply to the Iliad and the Odyssey. It was interesting. I was just talking to someone who um, was telling me about their son reading the Song of Achilles and saying how important it was to see a gay star athlete. And I, I thought that was such a wonderful way to look at Achilles <laughs> as, you know, a star athlete, because in, in a way that's sort of what he was. He was closer to like a celebrity athlete. Um, and and I, I think that representation is so important. And I would never have written Song of Achilles any other way than, you know, making um, a love story at the center of it. Now, if I want to get really technical on this, you know, the idea of gay and straight is a little bit anachronistic when we're looking at the ancient world, but certainly, you know, same-sex relationships were not, at, I mean, they, they were all over the place. It's just that gay and straight are, are more modern words to describe it, and, and ancient understanding was, was slightly different. Um, but there were still plenty of pressures to, to force people in particular ways. So I think, um, I don't think I can choose between Patroclus or, or Circe. I loved living in both their worlds and speaking up for, for both their perspectives. Um, I would love to see more focus on um, some of the enslaved characters going forward. I feel like that there are, as Emily said, there are many, many aristocrats in these stories. And I would love to, I would love to focus on the characters who um, don't have power. So there's an audience question to Emily. What part of the Odyssey did you find most difficult to translate in order to make it more accessible to as many people as possible? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I quite um, can come up with a good example of um, where I struggled with accessibility. I mean, I guess for me, there was there were times when there were struggles with um, with both visibility and ethics. And one case that I think of, that I think about that I struggled with for sure was the this picks up on what Madeline just said about the depiction of enslaved people in the Odyssey um, is the depiction of Eumaeus. Um, as readers may remember that he's the only character that the narrator speaks to in the second person and the narrator says, and then you, Eumaeus, did blah, blah, blah. And then you, Eumaeus, you managed to be the best kind of enslaved person because you were abjectly um, identifying as being 
within the family of your enslaver and you say that you don't didn't even miss your birth parents um and i struggled with that because i i think that it, it presents this absolutely um, abhorrent vision of enslavement as something which can be very positive for the enslaved and it idealizes um the enslaved person who doesn't even mind having his freedom slips stripped away from him and being abducted from his home as a child and being sold and and the enslavers are just fine for having done that um and it didn't seem to me that my job is to um to make all that seem fine i thought my job is not necessarily to make it all seem fine but also not to editorialize too much so for me there was a sort of struggle about how is how can i make sure that the reader is seeing clearly what the social dynamic is here and also what the narrative dynamic is that the narrative of the poem is focalized from an enslaver perspective but that, that and so, but, so it should be that the reader both sees that and is also partially in that but ideally i don't necessarily want to teach people this is the right way to think about slavery because of course i don't think that's the right way to think about slavery so that was that was a moment where i was sort of struggling i don't think it was actually about accessibility but it was about making visible something which i think is crucial in the poem and crucial in the, in the poem is that the poem doesn't fully see what i just laid out but it it sort of sees it it sort of sees its its own double think about we both idealize the impoverished and the enslaved and the homeless and we also justify their exclusion hmm. i love the way you're talking about that because that's something that i'm wrestling with right now um as i'm working with the tempest and and it's really um and the figure of Caliban and and how sort of the text presents him as this very um on one hand he sort of is bursting out of himself throughout the whole play and on the other hand he's presented as this very simplistic creature that has to be ruled and and sort of must be ruled for society to function yeah. um and and you know this kind of sort of classic thing of of casting enslaved people as childlike and so therefore yeah. they have to be they have to be ruled yes. um so that and like, and also oversexed, right? I mean, Caliban is also that the image of the the savage is the rapist as yeah. well, which yeah. oh yes, I can imagine there's going to be it's going to be I'm going to be really looking forward to seeing how you <laughs> deal with all that. It's very difficult. Yes, <laughs> thank yeah. you. And I'm really looking now. Now I'm going to go back and reread the Umea sections. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that I fully solved all the issues, but there are issues for sure. There's another question from the from the audience. Uh, when you use similes and metaphors in your writing, I guess both authors, do you try to maintain images from the epic poetry or are these images from your imagination? Well, that's a tricky question, actually. Mm. Um, I definitely allude to um, ancient ancient similes in in several of my similes throughout both song of achilles and circe um not not just homeric similes but similes kind of from all over the literature of the ancient world i have always loved similes and i love ancient similes i love modern similes um and metaphors i i, I think they are such interesting ways they're they're such a human way to sort of bring two things together they're they're magic when they work right and um but i i did not exclusively look at those because for me both my characters and and both my novels are really all about the voice and the perspective of that particular character and so when i was writing similes in circe i was i was really trying to think about what are the things that are in circe's daily life and how does she feel about them um and that that's where she would be pulling from so she would be pulling largely from the natural world she's steeped in sort of the natural world in plants in animals um in in potions in sort of those sorts of things and then she has this piece of her that you know was in the halls of the gods also but but mostly the the natural world so i i really tried to stay rooted in kind of the the granular aspects of that for for her character and and it was really enjoyable it was really enjoyable i feel like that's how i know that i have truly mastered a character when i can figure out what similes they would use I didn't make up any similes in my translation, but I thought a lot about it, and I, I, I constantly think a lot about the similes and metaphors that one can use for translation itself. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I have a translator's note for the Odyssey, and I sort of write about um, the ways that the translator is often figured as being like Penelope, and there's the simile from within the world of the poem itself, where the, the translator is the patient, faithful wife waiting for the original to, to deliver meaning to her. 
and that's all she has to do. She just has to wait and find something to do with her hands while she waits for the meaning to come in. And so I, I, I'm interested in what are the alternatives to that imagery and also what alternatives might Homer, um, might, might the Homeric poems themselves offer to those images? I mean, is the translator maybe more like Odysseus, wandering all over the place and there are different ways to be true? Or maybe there are other Homeric characters that we can use as models of translators. There's another question from the audience. I am struck by Professor Wilson's translation's note that this isn't your grandfather's English. I thought of Dryden's notes on his translation of the Aeneid, that he wanted to make Virgil speak such English as he would himself has been, have been spoken. If he had been born in England and in this present age, as novelist and translator, are each of you attempting to do some version of this task? And could you say a little about how you went about it? Emma, you want to go first? Difficult question. Sure, yes. I um, know what Homeric Greek is. It probably never was spoken. Sorry. No, Homeric Greek was never spoken. It's all a, a complete amalgam. It's a literary language, it, it, or it's a poetic language as opposed to a literate language. It's a language which emerges out of a very, very long oral folk tradition based on a, an amalgam of different dialects of Greek, which were never all spoken at the same time in the same place. So in that sense, I don't think there's any possible equivalent within the Anglophone Homer, within the Anglophone folk tradition, poetic tradition, um, anything like that. But we don't have an oral tradition that has that um, longevity. And I, and I did think about, you know, in, in some ways, the equivalent would be to write a kind of English that's an, an amalgam. I mean, to write an English that includes, here's some Chaucerian English, and then here's some California slang, and then here's some Glaswegian slang, and then here's some um, New York slang, and I can sort of mix, or not not only all slang, but just different eras of English. I mean, like like the famous chapter of Ulysses, from which is sort of a history of English, but going through within the within the prose of that chapter, the, the prose changes from one era to another. I think one could do a really interesting sort of experiment of trying to translate Homer into an amalgam English. But even that would not be an equivalent because of course Homer didn't register like that. If, if I did it, it would register as this is weird and Joycean and she's showing off. Whereas if you read Homer, it doesn't register as this is so Joycean. You know, but the, the, there was no Joyce in the, in the um, eighth century, in fact. And there was no sense that this is experimental. It was something which emerged organically and you can't actually make that up. So I don't think there is any equivalent. I think one, and I think in general, there are so many areas that as a translator, you want to find an equivalent and you want to think that's the equivalent of that. And then I've, I've got an equivalent poetically, I've got an equivalent metrically, I've got an equivalent stylistically, the mood is exactly the same. No, none of it's actually going to be the same. I think you can try and be responsible and you try and think through the difficulties and impossibilities of each element. And you can also try to think through if I make the choice that my language is going to feel more coherent than the English, than the Greek of the original does, is the, is the cost worth the benefit for that? And you can think, think that through about every type of decision you're making, both the verbal, stylistic, metrical, all these things. But it's not like there's a one right answer to how would Homer have, have sung if she, he, they were alive today? But there was no such Homer, and of course they couldn't be alive today. Well, we have time for one more question uh, from the audience. Uh, both know, uh, Novelized retelling and translation are forms of adaptation that requires discerning what is most important about the story in question to get across to readers and making sacrifices technically and thematically otherwise. I am curious about both of you, your thought processes in that direction, decision making. How you decide on what to prioritize in translating or retelling and what kind of factors play a role in that? One of the things that I, I love that, yeah, if, if any of you out there have not yet read um, the, the introduction and, and the foreword material in Emily Wilson's translation, I highly recommend it because I feel like you talk about this so beautifully um, and, and powerfully. I, when I was working on um, Circe, you know, I, I, as a novelist, I, 
I have to sort of go with what serves the story and and how I can I can construct a story which is is very different than for example if I were trying to translate the Iliad I mean the Iliad would never make it past a modern day editor's desk ever it is filled with digressions it's bagged out it changes its focus there are all these carrot who 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 question mark who in the in the you know in the in the margin um is what you would get explain who this character is explain who this character is um this character doesn't really seem to have a backstory but they seem really important that would be patroclus um and you know so i feel like that in turning it into a novel i have to sort of extract the emotional core of that story, um, while also not forgetting that there are all these other pieces, that all those pieces make make the world very rich. So um, how do I do that is I, I just, I think writing in first person really helps me do that because it, it really limits my perspective. So I'm not trying to wander over the whole Iliad. I'm just focused in totally on Patroclus's perspective and same thing with Circe in the Odyssey. Um, I'm privileging their perspectives, and so therefore, you know, that is always, always what I'm looking for. Um, but obviously, I do have to choose sort of which pieces make sense to me within that, and that is that's that's the novelist part of my part of my brain where I I can't really explain why I do that, um, except that I keep reading my novel and I think forget it, no, that has to go, no, that doesn't work, no. I know you like Hector, but he does not belong here. Goodbye. And so, you know, I just, that's just part of the, part of the craft is sort of making sure that that story that you've, you've, you know, dusted off all the extra debris from the story so that you're right down to the most important skeleton. And Emily, any input on the subject? So I'm, I'm actually getting a, a request coming in from the chat saying people are curious about the shirt. So I'm going to stand up so you can see the shirt. Oh. <laughs> 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 the the I did a marathon reading of my translation at, a, at, at the writer's house at the university I work at, um, the Kelly, Kelly Writer's House. They only made, I think, maybe a dozen shirts. So I'm afraid I, I don't think you can order it, but <laughs> that's, that's what I'm wearing. I'm wearing it in honor of Odysseus. Um, but so yes, the question of what to focus on, I mean, if you're doing a translation, I think it's one of, one of the great things about doing a translation is that you absolutely have to grapple with every single word, every syllable, every sound, um, rather than if I'd written a book about the Odyssey, I could have focused on this is the scene I really care about. Whereas with the translation, there's a way that I think, I think one has to have an angle, a, a take a view on every character. I mean, I, I definitely did a lot of reading out loud and working through what's my vision of this character, what's their voice, what's my vision of this scene, what's going on in the inter interaction between the characters. But I, unlike Madeline editing Hector out, I can't do that with the Iliad. In fact, I don't want to, but I, I couldn't even if I decided it would be better with not so much Hector in there. You know, there's going to be Hector. <laughs> I don't have a choice about that. Well, I think it's time to thank both of our panelists. We could speak more and more and longer. Uh, thank you all for coming to share our discussion today. I hope to see you all in the future. Many thanks to our authors for their great work and being with us today, as well as to the organizers of this fall, the book forum, Susan and Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olga. Thank you so much. It was always great to talk to you. It's a pleasure. Yes, thank you for all the questions.